Welcome to our ongoing discussion of types of structural action. <clears throat> this is from Chapter 1, Section 6. And at the moment, we're going to turn our attention to members in axial compression. So this is Section 01.6.2. And in particular, we're going to focus initially on pinned, pinned columns, which we will clarify in a moment what that means. Among the general comments, we want to make on elements in axial compression is the com compression elements can fail by material yielding or by elastic instability. Um, material yielding is similar to what we would have in the case of tension members where steel for example would begin to uh, stretch like a piece of taffy and there would be plastic flow um, or it could be like uh, concrete in compression which would shatter uh, it can also fail by elastic instability, which means that the compression member begins to sh change shape abruptly uh, substantially before it reaches the yield stress of the material. Elastic instability is a fairly long expression. It's also very descriptive because we're saying that the material is still in the elastic range, but some sort of instability sets in due to the fact that the member is not stiff enough or adequately braced. We sometimes call elastic instability buckling, which is kind of an unfortunate choice of words because we also have another word we call bending. Bending and buckling are quite different things. Um, they both start with the word B, they end in I and G, um, and there are seven letters and often are used interchangeably, but they are pretty radically different things that will become apparent as we go along. Um, buckling can severely limit the strength of members in compression, particularly if the design does not uh, account properly for buckling. So we'll talk about what, how we might go about doing that. But we're going to begin this discussion talking about the sort of classic baseline column, which we'll call a pin-pin column. And this is an example. We have some sort of a structure up here which is uh, designed to resist lateral movement in that direction or that direction or in fact in any direction uh, by virtue of this heavy post in the back that's uh, anchored to the base and then this hinge along the back uh, this uh, bearing surface up here is unable to move laterally then we've put this little column in between the column started off straight we applied a load and it's undergone buckling and by the way, we know it's buckling or elastic instability because the material hasn't yielded. And the way we know that is that when we take this load off, this column snaps back to its original shape. In other words, the material has not been damaged, but the column failed. And the only reason we're able to sort of stop this motion is that we, we stop the force from going, from continuing on through. But once this elastic instability takes place and this movement starts, it is not self-limiting. In other words, uh, if this was a gravity load in a building, it would continue to collapse downward, and eventually this curved element uh, would go into yielding and it would be some kind of mangled piece of material lying on the ground. But as long as we stop it in mid-failure like this and take the load off, um, we can actually make this column snap back and then we can do the same experiment all over again, and the behavior will be the same as long as we didn't yield the material in the column. One of the things I want you to note is that this is kind of like a pin joint here and in this failure mode rotation has taken place in that direction and rotation this way which is what accounts for the slope of this member near the end. Before it was a straight member and not unlike what we see in the background here except in the background we do have some kind of end constraint whereas here we have a very good approximation to a genuine pin joint. Now Almost all columns in the real world will have some kind of restraint at the end unless they're designed to be uh, really blatant and obvious examples of a pin going through the column. But many columns come to a very close approximation to a pin-pin column and that's kind of our base case for beginning this discussion. So, as we've mentioned, the modes of failure for a compression member or a member in axial compression can be yielding of the material, which may be plastic flow, which is something we would observe in steel, or shattering, which is something we'd observe in a brittle material like concrete. Under plastic flow, there's what we call a ductile change in shape. And we all are familiar with ductile behavior. If we've ever taken a coat hanger and bent it, 
we know it doesn't go back to its original shape and that failure mode is is what we call ductile or plastic flow failure. Uh, if the coat hanger was made out of chalk or concrete, we would never observe that behavior because it would snap beforehand. The other mode of failure, as we've mentioned, is elastic st instability, which involves um, a radical change in shape. And by the way, there are two kinds. There's the overall buckling of the column, and then there's something called local buckling, where some portion of the column begins to deform in a radical way even before the material reach the, reaches the elastic limit. And we'll talk about both of those. So here we have an example of two columns. There's a little fat column right here and a long slender column right there. And for the moment, we're, we've just sort of expressed some kind of testing structure which comes and braces this column from the side but otherwise doesn't uh, inhibit it against upward and downward mo motion and we have a similar kind of structure over here. Um, architecturally this would not be expressed in this way but you might have a pin pin column and a classic case that place where you've all seen it is in any big box uh, store like uh, um, this could be excuse me a moment Um, <clears throat> such as Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, etc. All these have columns in the middle that are maybe 25 feet tall. Um, those columns are restrained against movement by the roof diaphragm, which is subsequently braced off by the shear walls on the side. So almost all those big box stores have got opaque shear walls that uh, account for all the lateral stability issues. And then the columns in the center basically have a pin joint at top and bottom. Um, and there's another, there are examples of this, which I'll show you of the sort of fat column that's pin pin. But for the moment, we'll start with that idea of um, the big box slender column. So again, you see this kind of rotation that's occurring so that we end up with when the thing starts to buckle it takes on that shape and once that process starts unless we have a mechanism for stopping it it is not limited it's not self-limited in any way and continues on until the collapse has, has occurred okay so the big box example is something you're all familiar with uh, you probably have less familiarity with something like a fat column but i'll give you an example of that in the world trade center there's a tubular structure around the boundary of it and you really sense it when you when you looked at these buildings the boundary looks pretty dense there are actually windows there but it's so dense that it looks like shear walls on the outside and behaves a lot like that so the floors are restrained against movement relative to each other for example this floor can't move to the side relative to that floor because of all this material um, in the in the boundary wall which is inhibiting that from happening so the columns in the inside on the other hand um, don't have any kind of moment connection to each other or to the floors they're just simple vertical columns which are resisting gravity loads so if we did a little diagram here and we said here's a floor and here's another floor and another, another floor and another one and here we have some sort of column going through. Uh, the column is actually continuous at the floor, so it may be a slight conceptual leap to understand how that can be interpreted as a pin joint. But the way it works is this. If this portion of the column decides to buckle that way, even though the column is continuous and doesn't want to snap at the center, the various segments of the column can conspire together to effectively behave like pin joints. So in other words, this next one will go that way and then this one will go that way and so forth. Uh, what that says is this point is braced relative to that by the exterior walls structure and the unbraced length where the deformation is occurring is basically the floor to floor dimension which might be on the order of, uh, in a typical building, I don't know exactly what it was in the World Trade Center, but it might be on the order of 15 feet. So the effective length of that column is 15 feet. On the other hand, down at the base of that building, the columns are almost solid, and they're on the order of three or four feet on the, on the dimension. And as a consequence, they are 
considered enormously fat and yielding of the material would be a crucial mode of failure near the base of that building. Unlike the big box building with the tall slender columns that are lightly loaded, those are going to be overwhelmingly governed by buckling or elastic instability. The columns at the base of the World Trade Center would have failed through a uh, plastic flow. The actual failure, of course, ended up being a kind of buckling failure because when the floors let go of the boundary columns, the boundary columns very obviously buckled. Okay, so if we come back here and we think, we ask ourselves, in the buckling mode, um, the critical axial force, um, which is the force at failure, uh, follows this kind of a formula. And you don't need to worry too much about what these things are, but pi squared is just a constant that comes out of the mathematics. E is the stiffness of the material. So the stiffer the material, the better the column. A is the amount of cross-section in the column, and clearly the more material we add, the better. The really fascinating part of this, though, is the denominator, which is the ratio of the length of the column uh, divided by something we, we use the symbol R. And for the moment, I won't get into any elaborate description, but R is a rough indicator of the breadth of the column. So in other words, we're, we're talking about somehow the dimension from side to side here, and R is a lot more subtle than just that, but it's an indicator of that. And L over R is the length of the column divided by the breadth. So we call this the slenderness ratio, and the higher the slenderness ratio, the larger the denominator and the lower the critical force. In other words, the column fails much more easily if you have a slender column. And we actually have this mathematical expression of what slenderness is, uh, which makes sense. It's the length over the breadth. All right, so what that says is if we can figure out a way to brace a column so we have a much shorter column or we just look at a shorter column, it should work a lot better. So in this case, we've got a piece of acrylic tubing that's that length, and then we have one that's longer. And uh, this, this testing mechanism, by the way, has stops down at the bottom here. So we have just reached the failure point. And in fact, in the case of this situation, um, we appear to have some buckling occurring, but in fact, when we added a little more load, this uh, acrylic, which is a brittle material, shattered. But basically, we had 190 pounds as the failure mode for a column of this length. When we used the same material at a column of that length, it only held 25 pounds. So the point there is slenderness uh, can be a huge enemy in terms of the effective utilization of the material because here we're demonstrating this material can hold at least 190 pounds but when we make it into the configuration of a tall slender column it doesn't hold nearly as much. So one of the things we want to do is is to never leave a column with enormous unbraced lengths because then it can't be working efficiently as a column. Okay so there are several ways we can approach the design of a column. One is to modify the column breadth. Um, and in this little experiment, we've taken basically a sheet of styrene that's three inches wide by a sixteenth of an inch thick. And we've made a whole bunch of columns, all of which are using that basic um, unit of material. So in this case, we have the wide sheet that won't even work as a column, it just collapses. And then we've sliced this sheet into seven pieces and we laminated them together to make a solid rod that's seven sixteenths by about seven sixteenths. Then we've taken this and we've cut it into three strips and glued them together to make a triangular cross section. And then we cut it into four strips that are three quarter inches each and made it into a square section. And so we have a whole bunch of tests that we did of that, and we'll run through that really quickly. Uh, as I mentioned, you can't even make this material in that configuration stand up. The thin direction is just too weak and it won't work. Uh, this column sort of works, but not very well. So when we put this load on that 36 inch long column, we were able to support 15 pounds before we observed this buckling mode. And again, I remind you, this column started off straight and it buckled and the whole process has been stopped because there are stops underneath this platform. 
So we designed this so we could very clearly see the initiation of this failure, but then we could stop it before we destroyed the column because when we designed this experiment, we used to have to do it every year. And uh, we're gonna try and reconstruct that experiment in video form for future refinements of this lecture. But for the moment, you're gonna have to take it from me that this started off straight and abruptly and suddenly went there and the only thing that kept it from continuing to failure was these little um, uh, strap uh, clamps around the vertical elements here. So that amount of material in this configuration uh, supported about 15 pounds, which includes the, this 10 pound weight plus this five pound material plus the weight of this testing rig. Now when we put it in a triangular shape, we jump from that 15 pounds up to 95 pounds. So in other words, this tubular shape uh, that gets most of the material away from the center line is much, much stronger. And then when we went to square, we went to 115 pounds. If we had been able to go to circular, we probably would have run this up to about 120 or 125. It would not have been radically better than this. Unfortunately, in this experiment, we could never figure out a way to get this material to take on a round configuration without um, melting the plastic, and then it had uh, fundamentally different uh, properties, like the elastic modulus changed and various kinds of damage occurred to it. So we had to stop this experiment at square, but it, it shows you in a quite dramatic way how redesigning the cross-section uh, in a way that increases breadth is tremendously important. Now, sometimes we can push a process like this to the extreme where it ceases to be valuable. For example, in this case, uh, this column, which is made out of 16th inch thick chipboard, um, there's a whole series of studies we did where we made the cross section larger and larger. We've now reached the point where you observe this kind of snaky fa failure mode in the face of the column. In other words, the material right near the corners is working and it's properly braced, but we're not getting much beneficial effect from the material out near, near the middle of the face. That material is all buckled, and this failure mode is what we call local buckling. So we're, we're saying, let's get the cross section of the column bigger and bigger, but there's a limit to that process, at which point uh, local buckling becomes a concern. Um, In some cases, of course, we don't have local buckling even though we make the column very large and we don't even have buckling at all and the concern that we mentioned is the one we talked about already where down at the bottom of the World Trade Center these columns were almost four feet in cross-sectional dimension. They're three or four feet, but on the other hand the floor-to-floor -floor dimension is 15 feet. So that goes into the zone of what we call a fat column and we don't really need to worry about configuring such a column to get material even further from the center line because it's inherently already so far away from the center line just by the sheer quantity of material that we don't need to worry about it. So shape becomes a much less crucial issue when you have a massively loaded column of this sort. We can do something we call open shapes. That we just talked about the benefit of closed shapes, uh, tubular shapes which get all the material away from the neutral axis and make it more helpful in terms of resisting the lateral movement associated with elastic instability. But sometimes it's worth it to just use a simpler to make section. So here, what, for example, we have a wide flange section or an H section, which we're using as a column. And in most multi-story buildings, uh, there's no merit in going with a closed tube like this uh, because it's hard to make connections, but also the columns end up inherently fat enough that we're just as well off using uh, some kind of a configuration like this. Um, sometimes we think we're using methods that get material away from the neutral axis uh, and we expect them to behave a lot better they do, than they do, but we end up with uh, local buckling issues. So here in this case, we've done something called a cruciform column and when we loaded it up, what we discovered was the, the center line down the column remains straight as an arrow, and that's where the load is being handled because the material near the core of the column is not buckled, 
but the material out near the boundary you'll notice has basically given up. It's got all these wiggles in it, some of which are extreme. That material is helping to brace the core, but it's not contributing in terms of uh, handling any of the axial load. And this is why you don't see many cruciform columns, because cruciform columns exhibit this form of deformation, which we call lateral torsional buckling. In other words, the cross section starts to rotate. Um, in essence, it's not the torsional movement so much as all this material near the boundary is just conspiring to move together and, and basically a sort of pinwheel pattern. And, and so we see a torsional deformation, but one way of looking at it is the unbraced material out near the edges of this column is simply not well enough braced and it basically is going to buckle in whatever way it chooses in order to shed load. Uh, we might come along, these are just some more column images of that failure mode. We can come along and use some, and I have a picture of this somewhere, we can add flanges. So we add some width near the ends to help brace that material. That actually doesn't help too much uh, because what will happen is It'll stay straighter longer, but then once that material near the boundary actually does buckle, which it does, uh, in this case, we don't get the, the real wiggly <coughs> behavior that we saw in the previous version, but all this material here still is buckled. <coughs> it's basically shed load. And so this column is not behaving a whole lot better in terms of its final load capacity than this one. Um, it, it doesn't have the extreme sort of back and forth wiggles that this does, um, but nonetheless, the material out near the boundary has failed. So this is why you don't see very many cruciform columns. And in fact, when you do see them here, you'll notice we have very wide flanges out near the boundary to the point that you almost are starting to lose the cruciform uh, sense of it uh, because it's coming close to enclosure here. Um, and by the way, in the case of these things, you'll notice everything on the bottom is ground at a bevel, and that's because they're going to do full penetration weld to a really thick base plate. Uh, so this is an example of a cruciform column um, that will probably work pretty well, um, but it's not your sort of typical vision of a cruciform column. That ends our video on uh, axial compression in pin-pinned columns.